Hello, it's Sarah. This is Hardcover Hearts, and I'm here with my week of reading wrap up. This is where I talk about the books that I read this week, what I'm currently reading, and then potentially could read next week based on my mood. I had a very strange week, really, really high highs and really low lows. So let's get into it. So interestingly, I read two books from my book of the month club backlist that I that I have been collecting. Uh, so I wanted to kind of make some progress against that. The first thing that I wanted to read was the Jane Harper, The Survivors. Uh, now, I have been a fan of Jane Harper's other works, uh, The Dry, The Lost Man. I, I just, she has an atmospheric way of writing mysteries and thrillers. I think they're more mysteries than thrillers that I really, really liked. And so when I heard that she had a new one coming out, I was excited. It just sort of really let me down um, in, a, in a few different ways. So let me tell you a little bit about the story briefly. Uh, so this is the story of Kieran. And Kieran has come back to his childhood home uh, with his brand new daughter and uh, the baby's mother. And his father is in failing health. He has Alzheimer's and they're going to move the, the mother and father someplace where the father can get better help. And so he's kind of returning back to this, to his home and he's there on the beach and he sees some people that he knows and, and it starts going down memory lane. Mm -hmm. Turns out that there was a really bad storm many years earlier, and uh, some people died in that storm, and it has created trauma for the entire community, uh, including Kiernan. I won't go too much further other than to say a body uh, appears on the beach and kind of stirs all sorts of things up again. Uh, you know, the promise was okay, uh, but th what I love about Jane Harper d wasn't here, and that is incredible atmosphere. It could have been any seaside town anywhere. And the story just didn't have the propulsiveness. It didn't have the interest and it didn't hold my attention like I expected. Uh, so for me, this really was, was kind of a letdown. Uh, one of the key indicators for me was that I kept confusing the characters, uh, specifically the male characters. They felt a little sim too similar to each other. Uh, and so ultimately the plot, the lack of specificity in, in the in atmosphere, which is what I read her books for, just kind of left this uh, not a good book for me. I was very disappointed. Okay, then the next thing I read, also from my book of the month club, I wanted to, like I said, kind of bust my, my TBR here. This is Aftershocks, a memoir by Nadia Owusu. I was very interested in this because Nadia has a background where she has lived in many, many places, is multilingual, and, and kind of talks to this kind of nomad experience that she had. Her father was in the UN and they had to move frequently, and the mother was not in the picture. Uh, what we have here is, is a memoir of trauma, of of resilience, of trauma, of family, of splintered family, uh, and just a, a life lacking roots, lacking familial roots, as well as roots in any location. And, and mental health uh, issues. I, 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 I liked a lot of what she was saying. I felt like this was a case where the structure of how she chose to write the book got in the way of the story itself. And in that, she talks about aftershocks and the, and the idea of earthquakes and this idea of geological disruptions. And she uses that to have an entree into some of the things that she wants to talk about. And unfortunately, I think her story was actually stronger and didn't need that structure. I think it was clever and it maybe helped her to write it, write something that was maybe traumatic, but oftentimes I felt that it got in the way or it caused us to loop back and create some repetition that didn't need to be there. An important story, an interesting story, again, structure kind of, uh, sometimes I just, I don't like to see the framing so heavily. 
Uh, I like it to support the story, but when it becomes more important than the story, um, I, you can lose me that way. So two kind of ands there, but let's talk about something that was magnificent. So this is a new writer to me. This is Natalia Ginsberg. This is Voices in the Evening. Uh, look at that. This is a brand new reissue from New Directions. Uh, let me read out who the translator was. Translation from the Italian by D.M. Lowe. Uh, okay, just real, I uh, love that cover, love it. So this was originally written in 1961 and we're following a village in Italy and the and a specific family and kind of the, the other people in this little village. Uh, we have the, the main character that we follow is the father, the patriarch, and he owns this factory. And the factory is very important in this little tech, little village. We open and it's at the end of World War II and there's a reckoning with fascism and how fascism kind of took hold in this town. And the P, one specific character that that turned and aligned himself with the fascists, how does he re-enter re this village and re-enter the family? Uh, we have all the members of his family and who fought for, who fought against, and we follow forward. We see them fall in love. We see them get married. We see uh, how their families uh, inter interact, uh, where they're surprised by by the marriages, uh, who they chose to marry, uh, all of these little intricacies. And and what I loved is the family is so, is they don't always like each other. They don't always get along. There's humor. Uh, there's some poignancy. There's definitely trauma, but it, it's so well rendered. It's so interestingly told. It's a slim, tiny book, but it is a delight I will say that the translation was a little clunky in points uh, where it, it didn't flow in English. You could tell that they were trying to translate more authentically to what would be said in Italian and it didn't really come through as well. So that kind of got in the way a little bit. But I just thought this was such a great introduction to her work. And I have a couple other ones I'll, sh I'll show you. I'm, I'm very excited to read more of Natalia Ginsburg's work after reading this. So I highly recommend uh, if you like works in translation, anything after World War II, uh, women writers, uh, women writers from Italy who are not Elena Ferranti, this would be a really good book for you to, to pick up. Uh, then I can't tell you too much about this because I haven't checked in with Leo yet, or I'm waiting for him to check in with me. But we read our next in our Anita Bruckner oeuvre. This is Fraud. So with this, we've uncovered something. And this is not a surprise uh, to Leo. So I won't, uh, this won't be something that I, I, sh I can't share. We're going to switch up how we do this. Uh, we're finding that she is incredibly repetitious with her themes. Now we knew this, but we didn't realize exactly how repetitious. Uh, we are kind of in a, what's, what's the word when you're, a ham, we're in a hamster wheel where we're visiting the same things over and over and over again. And when you read one a month, it's starting to get a little bit tedious. So we're not gonna do the reading how we normally do it, which we normally will read three chapters and then have a conversation and then read chapters, three chapters and have a conversation. And it used to be great because uh, there was so much meat. She's a dense writer. She's very stylistic. Her writing is still beautiful, but there's only so much that we can take and have there's, we're finding less to discuss, I think is the bigger thing. So we're going to speed it up and, and only check in in the halfway point. So we'll, we'll continue the, the, the project and read all of them. But I really hope that she finds a way to break out of this old, older single woman who's lonely and doesn't under, isn't understood and who will look after her in her old age and, uh, this, this, anti-feminist um, 
inability to see her own worth and and forge an, her own life for herself. It's getting a little tedious, Anita. So we really hope Miss Bruckner steps it up. I'll talk more about this one specifically next week after Leo and I check in. Another one I can't talk too much about. I, uh, I'll talk a little bit about this because I don't think they'll watch. But I'm meeting uh, my In Real Life book club to talk about this book, Burnt Sugar by Avni Doshi. Uh, this is what we're reading for the Booker Booker shortlist. And the, this was, wow, a ferocious read. Uh, it says here, taught, unsettling, and ferocious, and uh, agreed. Uh, I mentioned last week that the specificity of the writing was uh, was really pulling me in. And it, it kept me engaged through the entire book. I, I wanted to see what was going to happen. I am still pondering the ending and pondering how I feel about it and pondering what I'm supposed to take from it, which I find interesting. And so I'm really looking forward to talking with my fellow book club members. It's just, just going to get their sense. Uh, I think this was an outstanding book regarding a uh, mother-daughter relationship that is so messed up. <laughs> it's so messed up. Uh, and it really broke what I consider cultural norms of my expectations of a book set in India. Uh, it, this, the, the women in this book were much freer, wilder, uh, more liberated, more decadent, uh, more debauched than I expected. Very subversive, a very subversive book. And again, the ferocity, it was, uh, was all throughout there. You, there. There's a lot of anger from the mother to the daughter, the daughter to the mother. Uh, and I, and the way it was told was so smart, so thoughtful, not linear, not exactly what you would expect. Uh, remarkable work. I'm so, so glad it was on the list and that I bought it. And this cover, I just find outstanding. So yeah, great, great, great book. I also read uh, two books for the next round of the Book Two Prize. What's so funny is I got called in to, to do the last round of the Book Two Prize. I put a link to the video for that judging uh, previous to this. Uh, so check that out if you're so interested. I had read five of the six books, so I was it was easy for me to jump in and help out. But this round though, we're down to two groups. One of those groups, I would only have to read one. The other group, I had to read four. So uh, of course I got the group that I had to read four. So c'est la vie, so, uh, there you go. But I was able to complete two this week. So that's great. And I got the two that I that I was most unsure of out of the way first. Uh, so very, very happy about that. So I'll read the next two in in the next month and a half. So let's talk about what's what I'm currently reading. Again, Proust, uh, slowly but surely reading through volume three in search of lost time, the Grimanti's way. I do love that cover. So making slow but steady progress there. This next book is blowing my mind. I bought this on a lark. Uh, I was getting some things from Blackwell's and for some reason I saw this and it piqued my interest. Um, so I usually don't do that I, when it comes to buying online. I usually have a list that I'm, that I'm seeking and I'm going straight for. Uh, but this was almost like browsing and I, on a lark, I picked it up and I am so, so glad I did because it is outstanding. The first section blew my mind, although I hate the name of this book. The women I think about at night, travels, traveling the path of my heroes. That part, the subtitle, of, okay, the first part I don't like, but Mia Kankimaki. Translated by Douglas Robinson. Let me show you that cover. It's a gorgeous cover. So Mia, this is a, a travel journal, memoir, that kind of thing. Uh, Mia is a 40-something single childless woman 
who is at a turning point in her life and she is looking for inspiration. She's looking for a purpose and she doesn't want to find it in a man or family. And she discovers these, these heroic women, these women that inspire her, that keep her up at night, that she thinks about like, well, what would they do? And so she decides to start following, literally following in their footsteps and going where they lived and discovering more about them. Uh, okay, so that's already an interesting premise and I like it despite the fact that I hate the title. But uh, then she she starts off with Karen Blixen. Karen Blixen is the woman who wrote Out of Africa. Now I have such a difficult... Uh, relationship with Karen Blixen because I I love a strong woman. She was a very strong woman. Hate colonialism. She was a colonialist. <laughs> um, I love women who subvert norms. She absolutely did that. Uh, she moved from, from Denmark to East Africa, married someone for their title, kind of gross, uh, and proceeded to they bought a land and bought a coffee farm and she ended up taking over the farm because he was completely useless SOB. So she takes over and ends up really having an affinity and, and caring for the people that live in the area that work on her farm that are indigenous to the area, the Kikuyu. She opens her home and, and will make sure that they're taken care of from medically if anybody has wounds or anything that she can do. Uh, so she is known for kind of being a de facto hospital for cases that she can handle. Um, she sets up schools. Uh, she fights for their, helps to fight for some, some rights that they, that they establish. She does some really good things. She also does some hideous things. She loves uh, hunting and she will hunt lions. And she has killed many, many animals just for the sport of it, just for the fun of it. So on, it's hard to root for her. <laughs> She's a very complex character. But Mia starts her journey wide-eyed admiration. So I go into this, you know, side-eyeing a little bit. But what we find is that Mia has this unraveling. She has this uh, epi epiphany after epiphany of, of what her privilege is giving her and gaining her and how horrible it is and how horrible being in, in Tanzania and seeing all of the ways that, that her whiteness and her privilege gives her entree and access to places that people that she's meeting have no ability to go into. Uh, she gets to see how the tourism of, of the safaris is something that the people who live there could never really enjoy, even though it's in their backyard. How it's all in service of tourism and all in service of these people trying to play out these colonialism goals and, and dreams and uh, hashtag... Uh, hashtag olden days, oldie timey uh, ideals of Africa when it was colonialized. And I just loved watching her come to all these epiphanies and to, and to feel uh, the shame and to feel uh, the, the heartbreak of, of the inequity and to have to have a reckoning with her ideas and her ideals of why did she did she see Karen Blixen as this as this um, figure this heroine that she was thinking about in light so I I was blown away loved it the writing's great uh, the topic is great and now she's taking on other other women and other adventurers and now it's broken up into artists and explorers and I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving it. Cannot wait to read more of this. Then I'm also reading How the One-Armed Sister Sweeps Her House by Sherry Jones. This is for Barbados for the Invisible Cities Project that I'm jumping back into. Really excited to have heard good things about this. So, uh, and already very, 
uh, crackling writing, just really great, really great, great characters. I'm, I'm interested in the voice. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm in for that. Now let's talk about what I could potentially read. So I have a few things that I've teed up. So I mentioned Natalia Ginsburg earlier. I also, in that same order, have two other books. These are from Daunt Publishers, and they're just fantastic. Uh, this first one is The Road to the City, and this is The Dry Heart. Both really thin novella size, both translated by Francis Frenet. So I might grab one of these and continue my journey with Natalia. Greensburg because I enjoyed the last one so much. Then it's Pride Month. So I absolutely have a whole stack of, of books that I want to read that I've that just been sitting there. So They Say Sarah. This is a novel by Pauline Delabroy Allard. And let's see, I think this was translated. Yes, translated from the French by Adriana Hunter. Uh, so I I have that. And this is about uh, this really intense affair by, between two women. And it's a debut. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, we have this. Uh, Last Night at the Telegraph Club. This is by Melinda Lowe. And this is set in San Francisco. And 17-year-old uh, Lily Hu. And there's like a lesbian bar called the Telegraph Club. It's set in San Francisco in the 50s, I think. Yeah, 1954. So I just, I, Sean from Pastory Time mentioned this, but she recommended this. Please go give their channel a, a look. Uh, so really looking forward to that. And then I know some people did not like this. This is Rainbow Milk by Paul Mendez. Uh, this is LGBTQ, uh, 1950s, a boxer and a humble humble Jamaican has moved to Britain. So we'll see about this one. But th those are the ones that are piquing my interest right now. Who knows? I might pick one up. I may not, but we'll see. I'll have to come back next week to see which one I read. As usual, thank you so much for watching. Uh, we are still in a global pandemic. So please, please, please maintain safe social distance. If you're around unvaccinated people or are not vaccinated, please wear a mask. Uh, let's see what else. Wash your hands and do not touch your face. That's it for me for now. Thank you so much. Talk to you later. Bye.